Ah, it's that time of year again, the holiday season. Spirits are high, music is playing, and everyone is getting together to celebrate with families and friends alike. It's a feeling that only comes once or twice a year, and I like to enjoy it while it lasts. There are so many winter-themed activities to choose from that I never have time for all of them, but one of my absolute favorite holiday traditions is going to see the new Star Wars movie in theaters multiple times because I'm a huge Star Wars fanboy who's willing to shell out all of my cash to Disney for them to keep making these films. Go see episode 8 by the way, I won't spoil anything, but I thought it was pretty good aside from a few major problems here and there, mostly revolving around the portrayal of certain characters, although Kylo Ren has become my absolute favorite character in this new trilogy, gee I wonder why, but anyways back to the subject at hand. I remember as a kid when I used to wake up during Christmas break and experience the pleasure of not having to go to school. Usually I would spend it plopped down in front of the TV playing the brand new Sonic, Pokemon, or Mario games that I had received at Christmas, but if I wasn't spending all my time on video games, it was definitely getting my daily dose of whatever programming Cartoon Network had to offer. Around the time of the early to mid 2000s, the channel was extremely fond of airing whatever animated holiday specials they could find, ranging from Grandma Got Run Over by a Reindeer, to a Flintstones Christmas, to The Grinch, to a Christmas Story. No, not that one. The 1972 animated Hanna-Barbera special that most people probably don't even remember existing. Now I know! And knowing is half the battle. G.I. Joe! And of course, we can't forget Cartoon Network's beloved originals that had Christmas specials of their own. Jingle Jingle Jangle, Dexter vs. Santa Claus, Twas the Fight Before Christmas, obviously, Operation Naughty, and more are all beloved favorites of mine and episodes that I would totally go back to for a video in a heartbeat. But that's for another time. Among all of these specials was one that stuck out to me like no other. It was something that, while hesitant to give a chance at first, quickly grew on me as one of my all-time favorite animated Christmas movies. You should already know what film I'm talking about given that it's sitting in the title and thumbnail of the video. It's Olive the Other Reindeer. Olive tells the story of a dog named... <laughs> Olive, a happy-go-lucky Jack Russell Terrier who doesn't act like your typical dog that chases cars and ruins flower beds. Nope, she's more interested in spending her time celebrating Christmas and all of the joys that come with the season. After she finds out that Santa might have to cancel Christmas this year because Blitzen broke his leg and can't fly, she finds herself on a quest to trek up to the North Pole and take the place as one of Santa's eight reindeer in order to save the holiday herself. The 45-minute made-for-TV Christmas movie originally premiered on Fox back on December 17th, 1999. It aired on the channel for its first few years, although I'm sure most of you who are familiar with this film knew about Olive because of its airing on Cartoon Network, which had been playing on that channel's airwaves annually until about 2013. Olive also once aired on Nickelodeon in the year 2001, just slightly before Cartoon Network had acquired the movie for itself the following year. Unfortunately, as far as I'm aware, 2013 was the last time the special has aired on television at all, but thankfully it's still available for purchase on DVD for those interested. I'm hopeful that it somehow becomes available in an updated format, maybe a remastered Blu-ray release or something of that caliber, although given its smaller reputation I'm doubtful that it'll be happening anytime soon, but it would still be nice if it did. The title of the film acts as a mondegreen to the phrase, all of the other reindeer, most famously known as a lyric from the classic hit Christmas song, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. All of the other reindeer used to laugh and call him names. They never let poor Rudolph join in any reindeer game. You ever find yourself listening to a song, whether it be on the radio or a CD or a streaming service, and you just so happen to mishear one of the lyrics so it gives off an entirely different meaning? I personally always misheard the lyric, it doesn't make a difference if we make it or not, as it doesn't make a difference if we're naked or not from Bon Jovi's Living on a Prayer. Can you really blame me there? I mean, it kinda sounds like it, right? Anyways, Olive's name is the Mondegreen, or misinterpretation, of the phrase, and can be heard in the way that all of sounds when compared to olive. The pronunciation is something that even I myself fell for as a kid. I would find myself watching this film year after year asking the same thing. Why is this dog named Olive? That's such an odd name. Don't ask me how I missed her name in the opening title card of the film because quite frankly, I couldn't tell you. I was a strange kid back then. Santa had this to say. Ho ho ho, I'm not sure if I'll have to cancel but it doesn't look good. Maybe somehow we'll make do with all of the other reindeer. But if not, Merry Christmas anyway. 
All of the other reindeer is loosely based upon a 1997 children's book of the same name, written by Vivian Walsh and illustrated by J. Otto Siebold. I've personally only ever come into contact with the storybook once in my entire life way back when I was in elementary school, so my memory of the original story is a bit hazy, but from what I remembered, the only similarities between it and the animated adaptation was the way that Olive ends up mishearing her name, and the general art design remaining relatively unchanged in the animated feature. After revisiting the storybook while doing research for this video, Sure enough, there's barely anything in common between the two aside from the main character saving Christmas by pulling Santa's sleigh. Everything else that makes an appearance in the film, characters, jokes, events, what have you, are practically absent from the book. It's an entirely different story, that much I can say for sure. Though I do hope to come across a physical version of the original children's book again, someday in the future. Olive is widely regarded as Walsh's most successful work to date, although she has created other notable books such as Monkey Business, Penguin Dreams, and the Mr. Lunch series. Olive, the character, was based off of Walsh's real-life Jack Russell Terrier of the same name. She states that the inspiration came from her petite but lion-hearted dog that would often get confused. I guess that explains why Olive confused her own name with Santa's utterance of the phrase all of while he was speaking on the radio. Walsh eventually went on to write a sequel storybook just seven years after the success of her first entry titled Olive, My Love. As you can probably guess, it's another holiday story featuring the joyful Jack Russell, only this time focusing on Valentine's Day instead of the Christmas season. I don't know how you can call yourself a dog, Olive. Come on, Tim, you know I'm not for that silly stuff. I've tried to be man's best friend by being your best friend, haven't I? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll get with the program, Olive, and start acting like a dog. The film was written by Steve Young and directed by reputable storyboard artist Oscar Moore, known for working on The Nightmare Before Christmas, a goofy movie, and, nowadays, most of the Illumination films. Drew Barrymore takes on the lead role as Olive in this joyful Christmas adventure, with other famous celebrities playing secondary characters, such as Joe Pantoliano in the role of Martini, her penguin sidekick for the majority of the movie. The legendary Edward Asner takes up the reins as the holly jolly fat man himself, Santa Claus, and we even get to see Dan Castellaneta play an angry postman who despises Christmas and all of the hard work he gets delivering the mail that comes with it. It's actually quite surprising how fitting all of the celebrity cast is for their respective roles in this movie. Most of the time when I watch an animated movie like this, there's always one or two actors that just don't seem to fit quite right for me, but Olive is one of those special cases where that's simply not true. I especially love the way Drew Barrymore plays up Olive to be this extremely happy, peppy, positive thinking pup that always wants to bring out the best in everyone and spread the message of Christmas. Her delivery makes Olive's overall charm soar beyond just the cute design which, as producer Matt Groening puts it, is one of the cutest looking animated characters you'll ever get to see. This dog, when you see this dog actually come to life in animation, you wanna, you'll never have wanted to hug a, a, a computerized image as much as this. What can I say? I'm a sucker for cute dogs. And Olive's design is the epitome of cute dogs. Oh, yeah, did I mention Matt Groening produced this? Yeah, not kidding. For a 1999 CGI film, it doesn't look half bad. The art style is clearly going for a pseudo 2.5D blend, almost like it has a pop-up book-like look to it. It remains very faithful to the original source material's illustrations done by J. Otto, as mentioned earlier, only placed into a more dynamic 3D environment than that of static 2D drawings. John Davis, the director of animation and founder of DNA Productions, goes into detail in the Making Of documentary about how the crew was able to create the look of the film using a blend of this dimensional manipulation. It's a 2D sort of looking show, but it's all done in 3D. Uh, the characters are, are modeled like you would a 3D character like Toy Story, but they're modeled flat, they're not dimensional. Their environments are dimensional, but uh, the unique style comes from this mixing and juxtaposing of flat and dimensional attributes. For the most part, I'm very fond of this film's specific art style that it has going on, although I have to admit that most of the animal characters look better design-wise than most of the humans, with the exception of the postman and Santa himself. And you can tell that Olive is a totally flat character. Even though she's in 3D, she's totally flat, which is a little bit ironic. Um, 
but that is the nature of the style of the, the show. I love the way these characters stand against the 3D background. It's similar to the way Paper Mario treats its art style in the sense that the characters are all 2D pop-up book like sprites and models that interact in a predominantly three-dimensional world. Each area of those games, especially Thousand Year Door, stands out because of the blend of its papery elements with the added depth and unique environments that allows for an engaging experience unlike any other game series. The same can be said for Olive. Even to this day, there aren't too many cartoons and films animated the way this one was. They're either produced completely with a 2D environment in mind, or they go the Disney slash DreamWorks slash Illumination route of having the same standardized appearance that's nothing to write home about. Perhaps the best example of a comparison to Olive's world would be found in all of the Cartoon Network City era promos that showed its characters interacting with each other and roaming around the 3D city environment. Even in 2017, 18 years since the original release, I can still say this film holds up to some degree. Maybe not quite as much as Pixar's early films like Toy Story or A Bug's Life, which essentially set the standard for CGI animation at the time, so is it really fair to make that comparison? Eh, uh, debatable. All I know is that Pixar is responsible for creating one of the most disturbing monstrosities this world has ever seen. Whew, <sighs> that baby still gives me nightmares to this day. The documentary also elaborates on how the animators modeled a 3D version of Olive to be used in more rapid, dynamic shots, such as when she has to take off with Santa's sleigh. And we've actually got a stunt version of Olive that we did actually do in 3D uh, for scenes that uh, require a lot of rapid uh, perspective changes on her. All of the Other Reindeer was animated by DNA Productions, who most people will recall for going on to animate the hit Nickelodeon television series Jimmy Neutron Boy Genius just a few years later. The studio's final production was the 2006 computer animated theatrical film, The Ant Bully. The movie wasn't all too exciting, and it showed with its final gross earnings only being just over $55 million with a $50 million budget. A lot of the crew working on the film were laid off just before its release, leading to the animation studio's closure only a few weeks later. The film was deemed a financial failure despite it making back its budget due to about 40% of the earnings going to theaters and other costs leaving the DVD sales to cover the rest of the budget's deficit. It was also going up against the film Monster House at the time, which opened the previous week, and managed to gross nearly triple the amount of the earnings that the Ant Bully had acquired during the same time period. Needless to say, this led to the inevitable cancellation of Jimmy Neutron on Nickelodeon, and marked the end of DNA Productions' contributions to the animation industry. However, despite being shut down over a decade ago, the website, of all things, is still up at the time of making this video. I'm not sure why it's still running all this time later, considering the studio has become defunct, but if someone was ever curious enough to check it out, it's right there for all to see. They still have Olive listed on there as one of their primary works, along with a number of other things that they've had a hand in making in the past. I couldn't really find anything of interest during my brief skim through, but hey, maybe there's something worthwhile on there that I missed. All I can really say at this point is, rest in peace, Paul, you creepy three-eyed monkey you. Rest in peace. Hi, I'm Paul. Got a blast. The plot of the film is your basic, we have to save Christmas story that a lot of films and shows have adapted before. Santa's reindeer Blitzen somehow hurt his leg in a flying accident and is unable to make the journey across the globe, and after all of Miss Hears Santa's announcement on the radio, she sets off to save the holiday before it's too late. So how about we get right into this, shall we? I love Valentine's Day and the 4th of July. I'm a little bit sad when Halloween has gone by. I'm thankful Thanksgiving comes around in the fall. But I've always loved Christmas, the best of them all. The film starts off with this lovely Christmas song sung by Barrymore herself about Olive's overwhelming anticipation for the Christmas season. After recovering from her laser eye surgery, or at least that's where I assume she's coming from since that's what the building says, Olive wanders over yonder, spreading the Christmas spirit all across town as she prepares for the holiday. After this brief musical number, she stumbles upon a penguin who introduces himself as Martini, a struggling con artist who's trying to get by selling counterfeit Rolex watches on the streets despite being in violation of the law. 
Joe Pantoliano does a phenomenal job voicing Martini in this special. His performance is probably my second favorite only to Barrymore's rendition of Olive herself. He completely nails that clever con artist role perfectly in this movie. Okay, okay. I'm a victim of oppressive corporate bureaucracy. Yeah, yeah, they fired me. I was a hardworking entrepreneur until a stool pigeon, an actual stool pigeon ratted me out. So stand up for free enterprise. Fight the man. So soon after this encounter, Olive decides to head home where she meets with her owner, Tim, who asks what she's been up to as of late. Olive's been having some identity issues lately as she doesn't act like most other dogs do in the sense that she has no interest in burying bones or chasing cars and would rather spend her time enjoying the holiday cheer. Yeah, we'll get with the program, Olive, and start acting like a dog. I'm sorry, Tim. Let's not fight at Christmas. There's no Christmas this year. <sighs> Luckily, she isn't feeling down for too long though, as her pet flea helps comfort her in her doghouse while the two of them wrap presents together in anticipation for the upcoming holiday. I love how ironic it is that Olive herself has a pet flea named Fido. It just seems awfully fitting, doesn't it? The two then go to turn on the radio in hopes of listening to find some music that might help lift the mood. Check out the Marzipan Shacks pre ramadan clearance sale! <laughs> what is it? high-pitched sound only I can hear? Forget it. And so, both of them find out that Santa's canceling Christmas this year due to one of his eight reindeer's leg injury, making it impossible for him to make his flight on time. Now, some of you might be asking, well, what about Rudolph? Yeah, about that. By the way, where's Rudolph? There's no Rudolph, it's just one of those urban legends. Shortly after this misunderstanding over the radio, Tim comes back to speak with her again, but Olive fears getting yelled at, so she decides to conceal herself in one of her Christmas presents until he goes away. It's during this time that he apologizes for snapping at her from earlier, explaining that he took his anger for Santa's cancellation out on her when there was really no need for it. Now don't ask me how Olive is incapable of hearing what he says, considering her astounding hearing ability was established seconds earlier, but she relies on Fido to translate what he's saying. Somehow, he manages to misinterpret Tim's apology speech as one of malintent, as he relays the information that Tim hasn't forgiven Olive and is planning on getting a new dog instead, when in fact he said the exact opposite. Whether or not Fido was doing this on purpose, uh, it's rather unclear, but I'm willing to give him the benefit of the doubt. And either way, this leads Olive to leave her home on a quest to get to the North Pole and pull Santa's sleigh. It is then that we run into the antagonist of the film, the Postman, played by none other than Dan Castellaneta himself. He's a character who despises Christmas because it is the most demanding time of year for his job, and explains his plight in one of the best songs in the entire film. They cut down bigger, fatter logs, so I can bring more catalogs! First class, third class, book, great book, is it any wonder why I sold Christmas? Ba, bug, and hum. Hmm, I wonder who those letters are addressed to. Need I remind you who produced this film? Despite his resilience, Olive informs him of her goal and pursues a bus station where she can grab a ticket and hop on a ride to the North Pole when who should she run into but Martini once again, who reluctantly asks for her to pay for his ticket. He's very dependent on Olive for the first act of this movie, from wanting to earn some money off of his selling of a Rolex watch to his need of a ride someplace else. It serves as the beginning of his character development and is worth keeping in mind as his change of heart will become more important as the film goes on. Anywho, the postman shows up and attempts to take Olive into custody so that she doesn't get to the North Pole and save Christmas in time, only to be thwarted with Martini's return of the favor when he throws some pens his way to cause him to slip, allowing them to escape on the bus just as planned. I find it funny that of all animals, a flightless bird was chosen to assist this flightless dog on a mission to help fly Santa's sleigh. This leads our heroes to come into contact with the next supporting character in the film, the bus driver. I heard Santa on the radio saying that he needed Olive, the other reindeer. Excuse me, Olive, but Santa said all of the other reindeer. I'm afraid you just misunderstood. It happens all the time. I used to think the Pledge of Allegiance was about me, Richard Stans. It's not? Funny story. In fourth grade math, I was taught basic geometry involving shapes like triangles and squares because, you know, that's what geometry is about. And every time my teacher said the word adjacent, I would always confuse it for my own name because of how similar the word sounded to it. Heck, I still occasionally make the same mistake every now and again. And that, my friends, 
is your Shadow Streak fun fact of the day. So Olive proceeds to explain why she feels the need to go to the North Pole and help Santa as one of his reindeer despite her obvious biology dictating otherwise. It's the first of a few of her inspirational speeches that she gives throughout the flick as it serves to reinforce her positive outlook on the hope to save Christmas even with the odds stacked against her, and I admire that. I really do. Things even begin to look up after they defeat the postman for a second time after he tries driving them off the road and they continue towards their destination. A few hours later, the pair find themselves at a rest stop known as Arctic Junction, where they stop for a bite to eat while they wait for the next bus and catch up on the situation with Santa canceling his flight. Hey everybody! Don't despair! I'm Olive, and I'm going to the North Pole to help Santa! I'm the other reindeer! Olive! 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 Okay. One of the waitresses currently working at the diner comes by their booth to tell Olive that Santa is waiting for her out back, but when she goes to see for herself, the postman unveils his disguise and captures Olive in the back of his truck, driving her all the way back to town in order to prevent her from saving Christmas. It is during this time that she goes through some of the mail stored in the back with her while she passes the time, and I gotta say, some of it is pretty humorous. Dear Santa, I hate you, and I hope you never come again. Stay home. Love, Bobby. Dang. <laughs> I'd love to see the look on Santa's face when he reads that letter. Yeah, it's explained to be fake when Olive realizes the postman is doctoring these children's letters to make it look like they don't care about Christmas, but I don't know. I just love imagining the look on Santa's face when he reads something like that. In terms of the other packages stored in the back, she notices that one of the boxes is addressed directly to her. Ooh. Oh, would you look at that. It's from our good friend Deus Ex Machina. Denise who? Look it up. Normally I question the use of Deus Ex Machina, but the fact that the movie openly acknowledges it instead of hiding it in shame makes it a little more justified in my eyes. Its awareness aids in its usage in this particular case. Unfortunately, despite the package giving her a file as a way to escape, the kidnapping manages to waste enough time that Olive ends up missing the bus and having to walk all the way back to the diner on foot. But thankfully, her reconnection with Martini and guidance from Richard points her in the direction of a nearby bar where somebody will hopefully have a mode of transport that they can use to get to the North Pole faster. After getting bullied by a flightless reindeer named Schnitzel rada, rada. in the bar, Olive has another one of her inspirational speeches in which she gets him and the other tough guys to realize their mistakes and lack of Christmas spirit, leading them to turn their attitudes right around and express the goodness within them through a brief song and dance number. When you're this far north with no sun and light, sometimes tempers fray. It's an okay song, honestly, though it's more forgettable than the ones we've heard up to this point and the one that follows. By process of elimination, I guess that makes it my least favorite, but it's still decent nonetheless. This is where Round John Virgin, no, not the Silent Night lyric, the character, agrees to take Olive and Martini to the North Pole inside his half-truck. They arrive within no time, only to find that they can't get past the gates because of an elf running security who refuses to let them in under any circumstances. No matter how hard Olive tries to convince him that she can help save Christmas, he refuses. I'm filling in for Blitzen. I can't let you in. But I have to- No. Isn't there someone who I could talk- No. Don't you even care? Let me think. No. Now, quite frankly, it seems unfair considering we know Olive has good intentions here, but at the same time, the elf is just doing his job. I can't really blame him for responding the way that he does here, although I think that final no was a bit harsh. While it may seem like the obvious solution would be for Olive to just dig under the gate, the workshop is also guarded by an alarm system that will trigger if she were to attempt to do so, thus removing that option from her list of choices for the time being. Luckily for them, Martini executes a plan that somehow actually works, in which he strategically leaves an anonymous Christmas gift on the elf's booth containing a broken Rolex watch inside. When the elf opens the box, he realizes that it doesn't work and calls up the number on the attached assistance card, allowing Martini to convince him to shut off the gates temporarily when he shows up so that Olive can get inside while he proceeds to fix the watch. I seriously love how the movie takes advantage of its silliness in situations like this. The way that the elf just goes along with it as if nothing suspicious is going on is priceless. 
It's at this moment that Olive says her goodbyes to Martini and proceeds to join Santa's flight crew, in which she explains her motivation for why she's come all the way to the North Pole to help save Christmas. Despite being a little skeptical at first, he agrees to give her a chance and after a bit of a rough start, Olive and the other reindeer successfully take off and begin to fly with Santa to their first stop on their travels and I think I'm about to die from utter cuteness overload because I don't think I can take much more of seeing Olive's attempt at flying here, it's just too adorable. When the group arrives at the first house of the night, Santa realizes his bag of toys has been switched with a bag of junk mail, leading Olive to pick up a familiar smelling scent that leads them on the trail of the evil postman who's still partaking in his anti-Christmas antics. While the main events surrounding Olive's preparation for the flight had taken place, the postman managed to sneak inside the North Pole's gates and swap the toy sack with that of useless bills and junk mail. He also happened to capture Martini when he caught on to what he was doing, and attempts to drive away with the presents in a desperate attempt to get revenge on Santa for not getting him the toy train that he wanted oh so many years ago. Luckily for Olive, she manages to find his truck and force him off the road, effectively putting him out of commission, saving Martini, and getting getting all of the toys back for them to make their deliveries on time. Christmas is saved, the postman is given the comeuppance he deserves, Martini takes a job as the new postman, and Olive flies with the rest of Santa's reindeer to finish all of the toy deliveries on time, while singing what is undoubtedly one hell of a catchy song that I still find myself humming every now and again to this day. I love the fact that they made the Pope a Phillies fan. I think it's genius. The film ends off with a few final scenes showing Olive being accepted as a member of Santa's crew, in which he presents her with her very own reindeer antlers. We see Martini return to the zoo, where he traps the postman in isolation at the penguin exhibit, and Olive returns home to Tim where the two of them make up and enjoy spending Christmas together. Merry Christmas, Olive. Good girl, good girl. Oh, you're the best. And that, my friends, was Olive, the other reindeer. It's also worth noting that there's a brief epilogue following the ending of the film, which shows Olive and the other cast members experiencing the aftermath of the events that had gone by, along with a reprise of Olive's introductory song about her countdown to Christmas. Ah, nostalgia. You're a blessing and a curse. All these years later in this film still leaves me with a warm fuzzy feeling inside after the credits roll. Somewhere around early 2016, a few scenes that appeared to have been deleted from the DVD version of the film had popped up on YouTube from a recording of the original airing that premiered live on Fox all the way back in 1999. It's interesting because these deleted scenes seem to have been removed for inexplicably no reason at all. One of the scenes that got cut featured the couple that Olive was talking to on the bus give suggestions as to how Santa's reindeer were able to fly, while another scene features Fido listening to an advertisement on the radio. Uh, I wonder how she's doing. Uh, I wonder how she's doing. Stay tuned for the latest from the North Pole. But first, a message from Grandma's old-fashioned partially hydrogenated soybean oil. <sighs> Again, no idea why they felt the need to cut that clip out of the final version, but hey, maybe it was time constraints. The film was also nominated for a Primetime Emmy as an outstanding animated program lasting over one hour, although it ended up losing to BBC's documentary series titled Walking with Dinosaurs. The film also won two Annie Awards on top of that nomination, one for individual achievement in writing and one in voice acting, given to Steve Young and Dan Castellaneta respectively. One of the biggest questions I asked myself while writing this review was something along the lines of, does this film still hold up today? And to that I say, yes, for the most part, it does. Aspect ratio aside, its storybook art style complements its timeless appearance better than most other CGI animated shows and movies at the time because it still looks good by today's standards. The animation can get a little stilted at times, especially with moments such as the human's walk cycles, but in terms of a pleasant experience, yes, I'd say it still delivers in that regard. The film's brevity gives it an advantage. It's a film that's meant to be something you only need to sit down and watch once a year. Its charm should be enough to hold your attention for the brief period of time that it's on, but it quickly lets you go once it's over and done with. Olive isn't the juggernaut of animated Christmas specials like Santa Claus is Coming to Town or The Grinch or A Charlie Brown Christmas, and that's what ultimately makes me classify this as an underrated film. Olive isn't nearly as recognizable as some of the other holiday mascots from this time of year, and it's a shame because 
Olive is a prime candidate for representing what the Christmas season is all about. I see a lot of myself in Olive, the way she keeps her head held high and tries to do the right thing because I follow a similar philosophy. But with that said, hopefully this review inspires you to give Olive a chance the same way I did oh so long ago. Even if the film doesn't get the attention that I think it deserves, I still highly recommend you try watching it at some point. If not for the plot, then just to watch this cute little pup in action. Seriously, this movie gets me with that every single time. But anyways, Merry Christmas everyone, and Happy Holidays. Every day special, I'm not complaining, but I'm always counting the days still remaining till Christmas.